On the 22nd of October, 2013, a shocking incident occurred involving Philip Chisholm, who was a ninth grader at the time. Killer knew exactly what he was doing and has never shown remorse. I hate Colleen's killer and will never forgive him. During that fateful day in 2013, Chisholm had been asked to remain at school by the well-regarded Colleen Ritzer, known for her exceptional dedication to helping her students. Little did she know that her life was at its end. Chisholm followed Ritzer and proceeded to murder, rob, and assault her. Following that, he disposed of her lifeless body into a garbage bin before dragging it behind the school. Next, Chisholm went into town and utilized Ritzer's credit card to purchase a movie ticket. The police discovered Philip the following morning, and to their surprise, he still had traces of Colleen's blood on his hands. All of his efforts to conceal the act, including disposing of evidence and wearing a mask, had been in vain, and he hadn't even bothered to wash his hands. This animal behind bars the maximum possible sentence. Do not give this coward the opportunity to shatter another family's lives. All of the charges related to Colleen Reitzer were included in the indictment against Philip Chisholm. He was tried as an adult, and in February 2016, he received a sentence that required a minimum of 40 years in prison. Court will impose the mandatory life sentence for the murder of Colleen Ritzer and set a parole eligibility date of 25 years, the highest level our law allows. Disturbingly, this teenage murderer displayed a disturbing lack of remorse for his horrific crimes. Introducing Jamel Demons, widely recognized as YNW Melly, who currently faces charges in connection with a double homicide that transpired in 2018. His trial began on June 12th, drawing considerable attention from his fans and the public. N.W. Melly Case, he's the South Florida rapper, on trial right now uh, for the murders of his two friends, Chris Williams Jr. and, Anth or Chris Thomas Jr., I should say, and Anthony Williams. Uh, back in October of 2018, they went by YNW Juvie and YNW Sack Chaser. In October 2018, it is alleged that Melly fatally shot two of his friends and fellow rappers, Anthony Williams, known as YNW Sack Chaser, and Christopher Thomas Jr., known as YNW Juvie. In an attempt to make it appear as though a drive-by shooting had occurred, Melly manipulated the crime scene. This case garnered significant pre-trial attention, with Complex providing an in-depth analysis of court documents and a podcast. The bodies of the two men were discovered, both having been shot and killed. Melly's co-defendant, Cortland Henry, also known as YNW Bortlin, transported the bodies to the hospital in his car, emphasizing that they were victims of a drive-by shooting. However, evidence suggests that this was not a legitimate drive-by shooting, but rather a staged one where the shots were fired from inside the vehicle. Prosecutors allege that Melly was the one responsible for firing the shots and exited the car before Henry arrived at the hospital. What are we seeing on the screen right now? So this is the sidewalk portion I was telling you about. Immediately on the bottom left corner of the screen, where you see those white dashes, that's where the cars drive through. The okay. dashes are for then the seat pedestrian just walking across into the yard. Um, then there's a sidewalk portion, and these are the two doors of the ER. The left door on the left side of the video is the ER the adult entrance, and the right is the pediatric entrance, but it's one big area. And then uh, in the middle is the park bench, right behind that glass is the security desk. I'm sitting in the middle of both of those doors. And that subject that we see in the video? That's the gentleman that the person made. Continuing to publish? Subsequently, in the video, you can observe the personnel wearing gloves rushing to check the pulse of the alleged victim inside the car. Within a few minutes, the video quality degrades due to it being presented in court. However, you can still recognize individuals moving stretchers in and out of the hospital.
The prosecution placed significant emphasis on the defendant's affiliation with a gang known as the G-Shine Bloods. It's essential to bear in mind that the outcome of this case carries significant consequences, as Melly could potentially face the death penalty if found guilty. Previously, a unanimous jury vote was required to impose the death penalty, but the law has since changed in Florida. Now, an 8-4 jury vote suffices for the death penalty to be considered. There has been widespread anticipation regarding how YNW Melly will respond to the accusations against him, and it's reasonable to assume that he may be struggling with the pressure. When the trial commenced on June 12, 2023, Melly entered the courtroom with a positive attitude with a broad smile. After taking his seat, he covered his face to offer a prayer and then blew a kiss into the air. Really? Really? As the trial progressed, Prosecutor Bradley presented his arguments, but Melly appeared disinterested. He fidgeted with his pen and scanned the courtroom, seemingly observing the people present. Some individuals interpret this behavior as a sign of guilt, but it can also be perceived as anxiety. It's important to note that the rapper has Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, or ADHD for short, making it challenging for him to focus, particularly in a controlled setting like a courtroom. Word. So you are about ADHD. Damn. So, so when you were coming up, did they like put you on Ritalin and shit? Hell yeah, when I got like the first crazy. time a year straight. So you was on like Addies and shit? Much straight, Adderall, baby. Yo, that's crazy. Cause Adderall is like legit meth. Yeah, for real. That's, that's the why thing. I, I ain't doing it no You more. could do Adderall and like, you could literally have the most productive week of your life. Despite these challenges, the prosecution pressed on. They opted to call one of Melly's ex-girlfriend's mothers as a witness. To everyone's disbelief, she made an unexpected claim that the prosecution had threatened her with imprisonment. As a result, the judge dismissed her as a witness and deemed the jury potentially influenced or biased. Served with a subpoena in February of 2019. You never served me. I know you served at your location. I, never, I didn't live at anymore. Do you recall coming to the courthouse in February of 2019? Yes, I do. Do you recall coming to the courthouse in February of 2019? During the trial on June 28, the witness stand welcomed Detective Sergeant Christopher Williams, who brought evidence. This testimony carries substantial weight as it aims to contest Melly's initial claim of a drive-by shooting being responsible for the deaths. Uh, part of my assignment, which is to determine if this is a drive-by shooting, and my determination was that this is not a drive-by shooting. The case is still ongoing and the outcome for YNW Melly remains uncertain. However, he could potentially face a death sentence, which represents the most severe possible outcome in this case. Down in court today, banging his head on a table after a judge sentenced him to life in prison. The shooting triggered the university to boost security in and around. Meet Brandon Spencer. At the age of 19, Brandon committed a disturbing act by opening fire into a crowd of people. Thankfully, no lives were lost, but his actions resulted in injuries to four individuals. Consequently, he faced charges of four counts of attempted murder. This incident took place during a crowded Halloween party held at the University of Southern California campus in Los Angeles in 2012. The sound of gunshots led to chaos, triggering a swift police investigation that ultimately led to Spencer. He was known to have affiliations with a gang and held a belief that rival gang members were responsible for a previous shooting incident he had endured. In court, his defense attorneys argued that Spencer fired his weapon as a means of scaring off those rival gang members he believed were pursuing him. Interestingly, one of the young men suspected of shooting Spencer in the stomach in 2011 was among the individuals injured by Spencer's shots during the Halloween party. During the trial, several people testified to Spencer's good behavior, including an officer from the Los Angeles Police Department. His defense team emphasized his lack of a prior criminal record. However, 
The prosecution opposed that Spencer's involvement in gang activities and access to firearms were negative factors. They argued that by firing into a crowd, he displayed a willingness to cause harm, potentially leading to someone's death. When Brandon Spencer was handed a 40-year prison sentence by Judge Edmund Clark Jr. of the Los Angeles Superior Court, he strongly maintained his innocence. Overcome with emotion, Spencer began to weep, and in a moment of frustration, even hit his head on the table. Meet Jacob Morgan, a young individual who received a life sentence for igniting a fire that tragically took the life of his little stepbrother. On the 26th of October, 2021, Jacob set his own home on fire, resulting in the death of his sibling, Joshua Alexander Hill. He was charged with the killing of his brother and was sentenced to 15 years behind bars. Jacob Morgan is clearly aware of the horrifying mistake he made one that cost an innocent life. It's evident from his emotional response that he deeply regrets his reckless decision. As he prays and cries while the judge delivers the sentence, it becomes apparent that the judge is not inclined to show much sympathy. That's an extreme recklessness. And that's intent. That's maliciousness. That's a definition of malice. Instead, the judge gives a harsh lesson in the realities of life through a life sentence. He has to take responsibility. The terror on Jacob's face and the grief in his cries serve as a stark reminder of the consequences of his actions. So therefore I am going to find that there is probable cause to charge the individual with the found over four general sessions for the way charge. This is a distressing lesson about the seriousness of playing with fire. No. Both literally and metaphorically. <laughs> give my life for Austin. I loved him a lot. Introducing Dylan Shoemaker, a 17-year-old who found himself in a situation that many can relate to, dealing with a constantly crying baby. Caring for infants can be demanding, and the constant crying of a baby can be quite challenging. In Shoemaker's case, he was entrusted with the responsibility of babysitting Austin, his teenage girlfriend's nearly two-year-old baby, who was just a few days away from his second birthday. The baby's nonstop crying became too much for Shoemaker to handle. At that time, Shoemaker was living in the same house as his girlfriend and her parents. He had been asked to care for the baby while his girlfriend worked her night shift. It's worth noting that neither Austin nor the three-month-old baby brother, whom Shoemaker claimed he didn't want to disturb with Austin's cries, were his own children. During the trial, Shoemaker made a shocking confession, revealing that he gave in to his growing frustration with the baby's relentless crying, leading him to commit acts of extreme physical harm. He openly admitted to spanking, slapping, violently slamming the baby onto the floor, and shockingly, punching the baby multiple times in the head while using a pillow as protection. Tragically, Austin suffered severe head injuries, including bleeding in the brain, which ultimately led to his untimely death. Shoemaker faced serious legal consequences for his actions with charges of second-degree murder and child abuse. Prior to the sentencing, Supreme Court Justice Matt Williams Bowler remained unmoved by Shoemaker's tears. It will show that you admitted on that on July 23, 2013, in a phone call to your mother from the holding center, you stated, and I got a quote from the court reporter, I am a 16-year-old blonde. Probably all I have to do is cry in front of the jury, and they're going to feel sorry for me, end quote. And referenced a significant phone call he had made to his mother, which likely carried weight in the case. Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats at the Cuyahoga County Courthouse for the prosecution of a 16-year-old Cleveland teenager named J. Quill Cleveland. 
This young individual has pleaded guilty to involuntary manslaughter, aggravated robbery, and other charges. In a tragic incident that occurred during a 2015 robbery attempt, J. Quill Cleveland took the life of a New York man who had traveled to Cleveland to visit his girlfriend. As part of the plea deal, prosecutors dropped an aggravated murder charge that would have resulted in a life sentence. And instead, he agreed to a prison sentence ranging from 20 to 25 years. Following a series of emotional impact statements from the victim's family, the remorseful 16-year-old offered his apologies to both the victim's family and his own mother. Following that, the common pleas judge handed down the sentence of 24 years in prison. Any questions about the possible penalties you're facing in these cases? A judge has sentenced the youngest trigger man to two consecutive life terms in prison. Nearly three years after he and his friends unleashed a reign of terror in Osceola County through random shootings that resulted in the tragic deaths of innocent bystanders. Conrad Schaefer, now 18 years old, extended his condolences to the families of the victims. I'm just like to apologize to the families that I've, that I've heard. I know that y'all never forgive me and I don't expect you to. I don't know if I was in your position, I feel the same way. Prior to the shootings, Schaefer successfully persuaded his father to purchase a .45 caliber high point carbine, along with a hundred rounds of ammunition. He allegedly waited until his father returned to bed, sneaking the gun out of the house, and that marked the beginning of the neighborhood horror story. My grandson, he was my helper, me and my wife. At this time, my family and I had no intention to forgive the guilty because of such a heinous and brutal crime that was done to my grandson, Eric Krupnerine. Inside the courtroom, Schaefer pleaded guilty to two counts of first-degree murder related to the outbreak of violence that left neighbors living in fear for over two weeks as gunfire struck their homes and vehicles over 22 times. 15 years old. I mean, that's the thing that's hard to wrap your head around, is, is this was a 15-year-old who was out, you know, with a, with a uh, uh, semi-automatic rifle shooting up Osceola County. At the conclusion of the hearing, the judge noted that Schaefer would have faced the death penalty if he were just three years older. I was 15 at the time, and I'm really sorry for the things I've done. And I know I did wrong, and I know my apologies don't mean nothing to you. I know it ain't going to change how you feel about me. While it may not change how the families of the victims feel, considering his age at the time of the crime and the signs of remorse he has shown, there might be hope for this young man. It's a complex and challenging situation, and opinions on the sentencing can vary widely. So I've seen a boy. A murder. You sure? Mm-hmm. There's video all through there. Well, I didn't tell you about that. What's your rap name? K Shorty. K Shorty. This individual, known as K Shorty, whose real name is Therese Powell, a rapper from Jacksonville, has been sentenced to a 12-year prison term for a firearm possession charge. This legal action took origin from an incident on August 3rd, 2020, when Jacksonville police responded to reports of an ongoing shooting at a convenience store located on Norfolk Boulevard in the 9,300 block. Upon their arrival, officers found Powell in a nearby vacant lot, suffering from a gunshot wound to his leg. Approximately 70 yards away from Powell, law enforcement discovered an AR-15 rifle. During their investigation, they also found spent shell casings from the firearm nearby. Additionally, they found a hoodie sweatshirt with eye holes in the hood, which could be used as a mask when worn in reverse at the scene. Subsequent analysis revealed that Powell's DNA was present on both the rifle and the sweatshirt. Based on this evidence, investigators concluded that Powell had been using the rifle during the shootout. Consequently, in February 2021, he was charged with firearm possession as a felon involved in gang-related activities. Last month, a jury from Duval County reflected for slightly over an hour before finding Powell guilty of the charges against him. One crucial piece of evidence presented by the prosecution 
was the lyrics of Powell's song titled On Yo Ass. Prosecutors argued that the song precisely depicted the events that occurred during the incident. Before his sentencing, Powell addressed Circuit Court Judge Anthony Salem, referring to him as Send em Home Salem, a nickname he is known by among inmates in the jail. Before his sentencing, Powell spoke to Judge Salem and conveyed that he wasn't a morally corrupt individual. The question was, was it true that they call you Simone Salem? In, in the jailhouse- I'm sorry, say what? In the, in the jailhouse, they call you Send Him Home Salem. Send Him Home Salem? I guess. Okay. It's a termination as you send people home a lot. And basically a lot of people want you as a judge for when it comes to sentencing because they feel like you're fair. Um, and I was kind of like praying, praying that was true. So that's why I said I was grateful to have you as a, as a judge. I don't feel like in your heart that you will sentence me 15 years for well, possessing no firearm and I'm not a convicted felon. The rapper expressed his belief that his actions were shaped by the challenging environment of his upbringing. He recounted witnessing numerous instances of violence, including the tragic loss of his girlfriend's life. So they would do something to just to harm them. And I was shot, my girlfriend was killed. And it, it was down here from there. Powell had initially been facing a 15 year sentence, but before delivering the ultimate verdict, Judge Salem considered Powell's prior criminal record. A significant factor that played a role in Powell's conviction was a rap video he had produced, which the prosecutors presented as pure admission of guilt. Or as Mr. Poe, you were found guilty by jury of your peers for the charge of possession of a firearm by a juvenile delinquent. You are adjudicated guilty of that charge. You're sentenced to 12 years Florida State Prison with 546 days credits. You have 518 in court costs. There is a $50 PD application lien. I will sign an order, appoint the public defender's office to represent you on appeal if your attorney files a notice of appeal in that regard. In the case of Antonio Barbeau and Nathan Pop, who were found guilty of the gruesome murder of an elderly woman in Wisconsin, the nature of their crime is undeniably terrible and shocking. They conspired to rob Antonio's great-grandmother, and their actions, which included using stolen money to buy marijuana and pizza, followed by brutal attacks on the elderly woman with a hatchet, are something out of a horror movie. Antonio Barbeau's change of plea from not guilty due to mental sickness or defect to no contest reflects a complex legal situation. The court's decision to give him a life sentence is in line with the seriousness of their actions. As for Nathan Pop, the court also handed him a life sentence. The question of whether rehabilitation would have been a more appropriate punishment is a difficult one. I know I don't show my emotions much. You know, I myself am not sure why. But that doesn't mean I don't. I took away someone's mother, their grandma, sister, friend, when I had no right to do so. While rehabilitation is a vital aspect of the justice system, the severity of the crime and the age of the criminals must be taken into account. Our statutes the way they're standing right now, 10 year old facing life in prison, I, I, I don't understand that. They aren't adults, they're children. I just wanna say that I'm truly sorry for everything that happened. I truly regret every single thing that happened that day. The judge's decision to impose life sentences could be seen as a response to the extreme nature of the crime and a desire to protect society from individuals who committed such a brutal act. Nicholas Lindsay's case is a deeply tragic and disturbing one. On February 21st, 2011 in Tampa Bay, he shot and killed police officer David Crawford who was responding to a call of a suspicious person near Tropicana Field late that night. The encounter between Officer Crawford and Lindsay ended in a deadly exchange of gunfire, with Crawford being shot multiple times at close range while reaching for a notepad. Quarter B, I got shots fired over here. Shots fired. I got an officer shot. Fourth Avenue South, tell him to step it up. Officer Donald Ziegler arrived at the scene and found Crawford near his cruiser, critically wounded. 
The incident triggered a massive manhunt involving over 200 officers from various agencies across Tampa Bay to apprehend Nicholas Lindsay. Despite being caught, Lindsay initially denied any involvement in Officer Crawford's killing. I did not do it. I did not do it. I'm telling you, I did not do it. Who did it? However, during the interrogation, his parents were brought into the room and they appeared to convince him to come clean. So this going to be okay, be son. It's going to be okay, son. You got to tell the truth, son. We right here. I was not there. Lindsay initially maintained his innocence. He's trying to help you. This is our point. You need to talk to us. But it's clear from the audio that his parents were influencing him. Oh, you're doing the right thing right now. You're holding up to your, your responsibility. It's okay, son. This is the price you pay for the things we do. Unfortunately, Lindsay's apparent remorse was short-lived. When he learned that he was sentenced to life in prison, a sadistic grin appeared on his face, even though he knew he would spend the rest of his life behind bars. This reaction is disturbing and heart-wrenching, considering the tragic loss of Officer Crawford. In Grand Rapids, Michigan, a juvenile court dealt with the case of 13-year-old Keyshawn Mann, who was charged with second-degree murder for killing his mother's boyfriend, Jermal Stokes. Keyshawn claimed that Stokes, who was 35 years old, had physically abused both him and his mother. One day, the young boy approached Stokes, held a gun inches from the man's head, and pulled the trigger. Tensions escalated in the courtroom as a fight broke out between the family of the 13-year-old murderer and the family of Jermel Stokes. The argument ignited when Lakeisha Mann, the boy's mother, expressed in court that no one could truly understand the alleged abuse her son had suffered at the hands of her boyfriend. The judge sentenced the teenager to serve the next eight years in a juvenile facility, which will take him until he's 21 years old. Following that period, he may face another sentence that could transfer him to an adult prison for a minimum of 162 months, with the potential for a sentence of life. She's not my granddaughter. Where did the evil come that was bred into a soul that murders their own father? <clears throat> Welcome back to our YouTube channel. After day murdering, three. day three after <laughs> murdering somebody. Whoa! The case of Sierra Hal Seth and Aaron Guerrero is indeed a tragic and unsettling one. Both teenagers confessed to the murder of Sierra's father, Daniel Halseth, and he was found dead in the garage of his home in Las Vegas. The young offenders were taken into custody four days later in Salt Lake City. District Judge Chiara Jones sentenced both Sierra and Guerrero to the maximum penalty of life in prison with the chance of parole after 22 years. You have 55, 555 days credit for time served. That is a total aggregate sentence of life in the Nevada Department of Corrections with the possibility of parole after 22 years of good service. Additionally, the court ordered them to pay compensation in the amount of $5,000. While Aaron Guerrero appears to be experiencing emotional distress, it's important to remember that people react differently in stressful and traumatic situations. On count one, you're going to be sentenced to 48 to 120 months in the Nevada Department of Corrections. On count two, you're going to be sentenced to life in the Nevada Department of Corrections with the possibility of parole after 20 years has been served, plus a consecutive 24 or 60 months in the Nevada Department of Corrections with a deadly weapon enhancement. Sierra's attitude of boredom or tiredness could be influenced by various factors. So if you're here, Miss, I get, as I get sentenced today, and I hope it brings you a little peace. Including shock, emotional numbness, or her own coping mechanisms. It's difficult to make assumptions about her emotional state without more information. Three murder charges. It is a mandatory life sentence if she's convicted. A death list and the victim's sister was actually the first person on that list, but we now know... This case is the single most cold, calculated, premeditated... In the tragic case involving the demise of Chilico photographer Victoria Schaefer at Hocking Hill State Park, two teenagers, 17-year-olds Jordan Buckley and Jaden Churchis, pleaded guilty to involuntary manslaughter. The judge sentenced them to three years in juvenile detention but they could potentially face three to four and a half years in an adult prison if issues arise during their time in juvenile detention. 
the Common Pleas Court judge imposed a stay on the adult sentence, pending the success of their rehabilitation and juvenile detention as part of a plea deal. During the hearing, both Buckley and Churchius delivered statements and offered apologies to Victoria Schaefer's family. Buckley expressed remorse for not coming forward sooner and called himself a coward, showing appreciation for a second chance. Churchius told the family that he had learned from his actions and would use the opportunity to become a better person. The crime took place on Labor Day in 2019. Victoria Schaefer, a wife and mother of four, was taking photographs of area students near Old Man's Cave when a log fell, tragically ending her life almost instantly. This Friday at noon, I'm Karina Nova in for Tracy. Jordan Buckley was the first of the two. More than one year since Victoria Schaefer was killed, and today her family finally got a bit of justice. She was editing photos. Monday was a holiday. She was excited to be taken to a log off a cliff at Hocking Hills State Park on Labor Day of last year. That log fell onto Schaefer killing outside of adult court really will give these teenagers a second chance of life and Fritz. Investigators quickly determined that the log had not fallen by accident, but it took more than a month before a tip led them to the suspects. This case is a reminder of the consequences of such actions and the impact on the victim's family and community. The case involving Jaden Churchus and Jordan Buckley, who were 16 years old at the time of the incident, revolved around the tragic events at the park with two other teenagers, including an older teenager named Miranda Spencer. After the incident, both Churchus and Buckley were interviewed at Logan High School on October 10th, and they were subsequently arrested. Prosecutors initially made the decision to try them as adults, charging them with slang, involuntary manslaughter, and reckless homicide. Schaefer was killed more than a year ago at Hocking Hills State Park by a falling log. As 10 TV's Brittany, he took away my daughter, who was a loving, talented, outstanding member of our family. Following along this trail back to the parking lot, when out of nowhere, a 70 plus pound log came crashing down. Learn and live the rest of my life in a way that will honor Ms. Schaefer's. After a series of court hearings and legal proceedings, both teenagers ultimately reached plea deals. They each pleaded guilty to one count of involuntary manslaughter in exchange for having the other two charges dropped. In the meantime, Miranda Spencer, who was driving the car for the group of teenagers on the day Victoria Schaefer was tragically slain, is now the third person charged in connection with Schaefer's demise. She was indicted by a grand jury on one count of obstructing justice. Shondell Jackson, born in February 1991, found himself on a tragic path on July 6, 2009. On that day, he was walking on the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee campus with his friend Derek Thomas, who was 20 years old. They encountered a fellow student, Nathan Potter, who was heading to his River West apartment, just a short distance from the campus. Nathan, a talented and beloved 21-year-old senior at the university, had a promising future ahead of him. However, everything changed when he crossed paths with Shondell and Derek. Shondell and Derek had planned to rob Nathan, and they confronted him with a gun, demanding that he give them his money. Despite Nathan's insistence that he had nothing to give, Shondell shot and killed him. Both men would ultimately face the consequences of their heartless acts. Shondell was detained, and his case went to trial. Throughout the legal proceedings, Shondell displayed a complete lack of remorse for his actions and showed no sympathy toward Nathan's devastated family. Witnesses even reported seeing him smirk and make disrespectful gestures towards them, even smiling at times. During the trial, Nathan's mother, Denise, bravely addressed the judge, acknowledging the true evilness of her son's killer. Shondell is in court looking at us, swearing at us, and smiling. The courtroom scene during Shondell Jackson's sentencing was emotionally charged. Nathan's father, James Potter, delivered a victim impact statement, sharing the pain and anguish his family had experienced. That can be said to bring back our Nathan. But, but your sentence can ensure that Shondell does not have the opportunity as a free man to inflict pain like this again. Is there such thing as pure evil? We think so. Shiondell, who had been convicted of first-degree murder and robbery charges, received his sentence at the age of 19. 
The judge presiding over the case voiced concerns that Shondell could pose a significant danger to the public if ever released and might commit another deadly act. Caring of human life and the need to protect the community, which I also fear for with Mr. Jackson, um, being out in the community. Um, I am going to go ahead on count one, the first degree intentional homicide uh, conviction, and I am going to sentence uh, Mr. Jackson to life imprisonment without possibility for extended supervision. During the court proceedings, Shondell's aggressive gaze and resistance to facing the judge provoked the involvement of law enforcement officers. The courtroom was filled with emotional outbursts, including sobbing and moaning, which were likely coming from both sides of the courtroom. Throughout the trial, Nathan's parents and his younger sister clung to one another, their faces marked by tears as they silently expressed their grief. <laughs> The sentencing proceedings were undoubtedly a painful and emotional moment for all involved. The courtroom scene during Shondell Jackson's sentencing became increasingly chaotic. I know that that is something that is reserved for the most serious of cases, and I believe that this case rises to that level. An unidentified voice erupted in a sharp scream, shouting no at the top of their lungs marking a breaking point for Shondell. In response, Shondell stood up and aggressively resisted the efforts of the officers, urging the intervention of a suited lawyer to assist in subduing him. A physical struggle arose, causing the wooden table in front of Shondell to be pushed away. Additional officers and the reported use of pepper spray were required to eventually bring Shondell down to the ground. <laughs> Amid this chaos, the cries continued, including loud words of encouragement and support from Shondell's own family. After some time, the officer successfully regained control over Shondell, helping him to his feet, handcuffing him, and escorting him out of the courtroom despite his continued resistance. At one point, an officer had to grasp the back of his head to maintain control. In the background, the sorrowful cries of a woman, likely Shondell's mother, could be heard, indicating her grief. Inside the courtroom, it appeared that Shondell's mother believed the responsibility for her son's sentencing lay with Nathan's family. An interview conducted with Nathan's mother after the sentencing highlighted the emotional toll of the situation on both families, especially on Nathan's younger sister, who was deeply frightened to be near Shondell. In contrast, Derek, Shondell's partner in crime, chose to plead guilty to his role and received a comparatively shorter sentence of 12 years in prison, while there are arguments that Shondell's sentence was overly severe considering his age he is currently imprisoned and expected to spend the rest of his life in prison. The case of Dante Wright and his involvement in the death of Jordan Clee is a tragic one. Along with Germarius Ellison and Delrano Gracie, was charged in connection with Jordan's death, which occurred on October 4, 2016, on a pathway near Pine Lake Village on Ann Arbor's west side. The trio was accused of attempting to steal controlled substances, clothes, and shoes from Jordan, who was ambushed by the three men as they tried to steal his belongings. Jordan, a strong athlete, resisted their attempts, and tragically, Wright shot him in the back of the head, ending his promising life. During Dante Wright's trial, Jordan's mother's statement was read, conveying her deep suffering. However, Dante's reactions in court including smirking and smiling while the statements were being read, were met with shock and disbelief. Jordan Michael Clay, born July 26, 1998. Murdered October 4, 2016, at 18 years old. Dante then delivered his own statement to the court, which appeared to show little thought or remorse for his actions. I've lost laughter and love. I no longer have the hope of having grandchildren. I've lost the enjoyment of holidays and birthdays and of everyday life. 
The judge overseeing the case looked unfavorably upon Dante's behavior in court and was almost inclined to revoke his plea deal. I just want to tell y'all, I'll be home soon, I'll be Keon, I love my family. Dante's defense lawyer attempted to claim that his reactions were not intended to be offensive, but it seems that many people didn't buy it. Watching you sit there, smile, laugh, and shake your head like this was no big deal, I'm very tempted to just say, I'm not going to accept this sentence agreement. We'll go to trial, and if you're convicted of felony murder, you'll go to prison for the rest of your life. That means you'll die there. Ultimately, Dante received a 25 to 52 year sentence. His smiling was in no way meant as disrespectful either to the family, to the victim, or to this court. The case of Keandra Cooks is a tragic one, as she was sentenced to 20 years in state prison for her involvement in a robbery that resulted in a shooting. Cooks and her then boyfriend, Kendrick Bass, used a dating app to lure Manny Purcell and a friend to South Daytona. Purcell, expecting a good time, was instead shot and carjacked. Kyandra Cooks was seen approaching the bench to give her statement before awaiting her sentencing. Her defense attorney had led both Cooks and her mother to believe that she would not be serving any jail time. So the shock of the 20-year sentence was met with horror. Circuit Judge Matthew Foxman delivered the verdict, and the emotional impact was weighty. I just want to say that I'm sorry. Could have been wrong. And I feel like Kyandra's mother dropped to the floor, wailing in agony, and her cries were so loud that the judge had to later restate the sentencing for the clerk. Second chance, so I can get out and finish school, and I can put my mama proud. Because I want to be her first child to bring high school to <laughs> It was at this moment that Kyandra realized the gravity of her situation and broke down herself. The case of David Moses and his involvement in the brutal attack on 81-year-old Dorothy Session is a disturbing one. On April 14, 2010, Moses, along with two other defendants, broke into Session's home, believing it to be empty, with the intention of stealing items. However, upon discovering Session at home, Moses brutally assaulted her, leaving her disfigured and bleeding on the floor. Tragically, Session later gave in to her injuries. During the sentencing, David Moses displayed strange and borderline disrespectful behavior. He was seen yawning, smirking, and even taking a nap right in his seat. This behavior was disturbing and added to the seriousness of the case. The judge, recognizing the severity of the crime and likely considering Moses' attitude, sentenced him to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. The case of the King brothers, Alex and Derek in Pensacola, Florida, is indeed a unique and tragic one. On November 26, 2001, these brothers, at a young age, killed their father, 40-year-old Terry King. You are currently 13 years old? Yes, ma'am. By brutally smashing his skull with an aluminum baseball bat while he slept. Next, they attempted to conceal their crime by setting fire to their family home. Ricky Chavis, a family friend, was convicted of being an accessory to the crime as he hid the boys in his trailer after the murder and helped wash the blood from their clothes. Raise your right hand in this form, please. Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth and nothing but the truth and nothing God? I do. During the trial, the brothers changed their arguments multiple times, which complicated their case. Initially, they claimed they committed the murder to end the alleged mental and physical abuse from their father. Following that, they stated that they had murdered their father on their own. Later, they claimed that Ricky Chavis had convinced them to kill him. And finally, they alleged that Ricky Chavis had killed their father and manipulated them to take the blame. In the end, Derek King was sentenced to eight years in prison, while his younger brother, Alex, received a seven-year sentence. 
This case highlights the complications of cases involving juvenile offenders and the various legal challenges that can arise when their accounts change over time. Matthew Borges on indictment number 2017-115. The jury having returned a verdict of guilty on the charge of murder in the first degree. The case of Matthew Borges, accused of beheading Lee Valoria Paulino in December 2016, is a deeply disturbing and tragic one. Both Borges and Paulino were students at Lawrence High School, and it's alleged that Borges murdered Paulino while they were both studying there. Borges initially informed the police that he and Paulino had smoked marijuana together in November 2016, which was the last time Paulino was seen alive. Paulino's body was discovered two weeks later by a dog walker on the banks of Merrimack River, and the details of the crime were horrifying. Um, as I approached, I got closer, saw her really sniffing at a particular area. Um, so I pulled her back, and when I looked, I kind of second-guessed myself. You know, I thought I saw a dead body, but I wasn't too sure because, uh, you know, it was missing some limbs. Initially, Borges was not considered a suspect, but the prosecution presented a strong case against him. According to investigators, Borges allegedly stabbed the 16-year-old victim multiple times and beheaded him to prevent the corpse from being identified. During the sentencing, Borges displayed no emotion or signs of remorse. Is the defendant guilty or not guilty? And if guilty, guilty of what and on what theory? Uh, we find the defendant guilty. He received a sentence to spend the rest of his life in jail, with the possibility of parole only becoming an option after 30 years. That the defendant, Matthew Borges, is guilty on the charge of first-degree murder on the theories of deliberate premeditation and extreme atrocity and cruelty. The case of Thomas T.J. Lane is a tragic and disturbing one. On February 27, 2012, three students were killed and three others were injured in a shooting at Chardon High School in Ohio. The criminal, 17-year-old Thomas T.J. Lane, was arrested and later charged as an adult. He pleaded guilty and received three life sentences without the possibility of parole. In the courtroom, T.J. Lane's behavior was disturbing. He unbuttoned his shirt to reveal a t-shirt with the word killer written on it, and his lack of remorse was evident in his final statement toward the victim's families. The victim's families had the opportunity to address T.J. Lane during the sentencing, and his smirking and smiling in response to their statements were deeply disturbing. I hate you for the pain you have caused, Nick. You chased him down the hall and fired the last bullet that paralyzed him. Things I was looking forward to, I will never get to see. My baby brother graduate high school, go to college, graduate college, get married, have children. I will never be an aunt and my children will never know their uncle. He was a mere baby, my baby. That murderer could have never been a fraction of the man Danny was going to be. He doesn't deserve to breathe the air that I breathe. That child stole my baby's life and he should never be able to do this to anyone ever again. Perhaps the most shocking aspect of this case is that T.J. Lane managed to escape from prison a year after being sentenced, along with another inmate, leading to a manhunt by the police. The police were well aware of Thomas T.J. Lane's behavior and the potential danger he posed. After his escape from prison, law enforcement agencies were quick in their efforts to locate and capture him. T.J. Lane's arrest was essential to ensure the safety of the community. The case of Martise Fuller, involving the murder of Kaylee Juga and the attempted murder of her mother, Stephanie Juga, is indeed a tragic and disturbing one. Fuller's actions resulted in the loss of a young life and had an intense impact on the Juga family. His insistence on maintaining his innocence and attempting to shift blame onto the media is an interesting aspect of the case. It's proof of the difficulty in some cases of holding individuals accountable for their actions and bringing closure to the victim's families. 
the life sentence without the possibility of parole explains the severity of the crime and the legal consequences Fuller now faces. The case of Aidan von Grabo is a tragic and disturbing one, and it's a relief that he received a life sentence for his actions. The fact that he will be eligible to apply for parole after 40 years proves the seriousness of his crimes and the legal consequences he now faces. The impact of his actions on Michaela Grote and her family is immeasurable. It's also noteworthy that von Grabo was targeting other individuals on a death list, and his actions went beyond the initial crime. The legal proceedings, in this case, have brought some closure for the victims' families, and the hope expressed by Jeanette Grote is understandable. The justice system has responded with a severe sentence, considering the seriousness of the crimes. It's clear that Aidan von Grabo's case is a difficult one and has left a deep impact on the community and those involved. The judge's decision to allow expanded media coverage is a way to help people better understand the consequences of teenage violence. Such cases remind us of the importance of addressing mental health issues and providing support for young individuals who may be at risk of harming themselves or others. The fact that Von Grabo's sudden behavioral changes were attributed to medication describes perfectly the need for a focus on mental health problems. Peace of my forever happiness. From this day forward, I can only hope and pray. And Shannon, very chilling details coming out of the courtroom today surrounding this tragic case. The Boulder daughter, the way that you did, but I am greatly sorrowful for it. And if I could put Lakewood, it's a shocking crime for so many reasons. The suspect is a 15 year old boy who apparently had a judge today ordered that the suspect is restrained because he's deemed a risk for himself and for the public. Letter from the principal sent to parents of students right now. They say that the alleged killer was recent slash whomever is home. It's also understandable that the judge, while imposing a life sentence, considered the potential for rehabilitation. The hope is that Von Grabo, given his young age at the time of the crimes, can take advantage of rehabilitation opportunities and eventually make amends. Big thanks to our viewers for joining the courtroom journey with us. Your interest in the stories of justice is what keeps our channel alive.